This is the Triple Play Fantasy Basketball Show. I'm your host, Coach James Lewis. My buddy Chase Ryder here to join me. We talk about a little Wizards basketball. How you doing, Chase? Doing well, man. I'm excited. Thanks for having me on. And uh, yeah, we hit October. We hit training camp. We hit preseason. So that just means uh, we're about a week away from opening night, which is exciting. Absolutely. And with new seasons, new storylines, new feelings, new hope uh, as Wizards fans, uh, it's hard to, to see the hope. Um, we've been middlers or bottom of the pack player. We have one of the elite players in the entire NBA, a guy named Bradley Beal, who finished just short of the scoring title. Um, and all eyes and thoughts are really on this guy. He's one of the biggest stories that come with our team, a, a star player who uh, his contract is coming to the end sometime shortly. And he's, we've got to make a decision. He has to make a decision. Does he pencil in for the long term as he's kind of said, or is it enough is enough. He's 28 years old and he sees that maybe this team is not going in a direction of winning. So Bradley Beal, um, your thoughts on one him as a player and what he's evolved to now and his outlook going forward. He's had some alphas with him along the way, John Wall for much of his career and who signed him at the, the super max and then shortly moved on. And then most recently Russell Westbrook. Uh, but Brad looks like he's the, uh, he's the only alpha in the room these days. What, what's your outlook on Brad, his, his mindset and, and, kind of his your feelings going into this 2021-2022 season. Yeah, I mean, if you look at these numbers right here, you, you can't really beat those numbers. These are career numbers uh for Bradley Beal and what what really you know, what I like about these numbers are that free throw percentage. Um and because earlier in his career when he was just a shooter before he was, you know, averaging 30 when he was averaging, you know, 15 to 18 um he was leaving some points um on the, at the free throw line i mean he what he started off averaging around 78 um consistently and then one year he dropped down to 76 um and then finally got back to the 80s but you know he's leaving all those points on the board and that's why i think he you know went from averaging uh you know 20 to you know eventually 23 26 and they hit, then he hit 30 and i think that just shows that you know even though he's a he was a shooter, he knew he had to improve his um, you know his his free throw percentage, and you know obviously he was getting to the line even more. So I think he improved on that, um, and he's a natural scorer. Again, when when we drafted him, you know we kind of just knew that he was this great shooter, um, but he is a a bucket, um, obviously, and you know this team, you know I think with Brad, he's going to obviously be the guy, but you know. Going from this is now going to be the third season. So, you know, he was first all those years with John Wall. Now you're transitioning to playing with Russell Westbrook for one year. Now you got to transition and play with Spencer Dinwiddie. And those are three different kinds of point guards. So I think it's going to be an adjustment uh, playing with Spencer Dinwiddie just because Spencer Dinwiddie, in my opinion, is not your natural point guard who's going to penetrate and dish. I know Spencer, um, I would say he's a combo guard, but he's a first, you know, he's a, a not a pass first point guard. Yeah, and he and he kind of had to get in where he fit in in the NBA. Uh, he, he struggled to kind of find a role on a team. And so he's like, I, look, off the ball, I can be effective. I can be a scorer. Um, but at, at the end of the day with his size, you know, it, it leans to 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 PG. And the last time we saw him playing, you know, a bulk of minutes for the Nets, uh, he did average 6.8 assists, which isn't like elite point guard, but it's still playmaking. I, I can still dime up a little bit. It's interesting that you point out that Brad's free throw percentage improved. He, he has always kind of left some points on the board. I think even last year, um, the fact that he's such a great shooter and he only shot – 34.9 from the three-point line. I think this is all something that as as a Wizards fan, I've always kind of wanted Brad to, to shoot more of those. When I, when I see Devin Booker play 
I always like, man, D book needs to put more up from the three point line. He's just his stroke is so smooth, but um, it's almost like a it's almost like a mirage where you picture them as this top, top, top tier three point shooters. But really, and when you look at it and you look at the percentages, they aren't at the top of the group. You, you they aren't this just lights out Ray Allen, Steph Curry shooters, even though their form looks so. And I think what Brad has done over the years is add to his offensive package. He's just, ha he has every move for in the book and it is, you know, his rookie year, he didn't have all of that. He didn't have all the, the, the step backs. He wasn't like, he, he had a, a nice frame, but he, he wouldn't put that shoulder into you to create the contact, uh, get you off the pump fake. Um, he just has a counter of a counter and his footwork's been elite. And he, it just really shows how much he's worked on his game to improve that. And, um, and we see that in his assists as well. He's been better with the ball in his hands and much to, uh, you know, John going down and it gave him the opportunity. But, oh, damn, he's Brad's good at this. So what do you, what have you seen at, 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 over the years? And I'm talking to Chase Ryder, uh, somebody that's been on the sideline of the Washington Wizards for the last 14 years. So he's seen this kid grow into – the man that Brad Beal is in t today. What has he done to his game, specifically on the offensive end, to to get up to you know contending for the scoring championship? Right. I mean, I, like I said earlier, getting to the free throw line, but also finishing at the rim. I mean, I don't think a lot of people are going to talk or think about um, you know Bradley Beal as one, being one of the best finishers around the rim. But you know, if you were to go back and watch you know all the games from his rookie. To probably is like rook all the way from rookie to third year um, in the league, he was getting because they were you know teams were running him off the three point line, um, and he didn't have really all these combo moves so at the mid range. So if they were running him off, he would just try to attack for a layup, but he was not finishing well. And um, now it's pretty much you know when he's in the paint and he's going up for a layup, it's you know it's it's cash whatever he's doing euro step uh up and under i mean his he's got so many different moves now um and he's finishing over big guys so again i think that's how he got from averaging you know from the late teens and early 20s to you know the last couple of years averaging 30 because he's you know collecting all those you know he's shooting 90 percent for the free throw line and he's finishing um at a high rate and no one's ever going like like you said people just think about bradley beal being a good shooter and, you know, if you kind of look at the percentages, you know, they're not, you know, he, he kind of, I think when we first drafted him, it was like, here's our three point shooter. But uh, like, like we've been talking about, he's got so much now he can score from anywhere. And I think that's an underrated aspect of his game of how he finishes around the hoop. And he's got, he's got it figured out as far as uh, the defense and getting into their body and getting to the line. And if he's not getting the whistle, uh, he shows that he 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 shows his frustration um, as a fan. That part irritates me a little bit because I feel like sometimes Brad gets in a competition with the zebras as opposed to focusing on the next play. But it is difficult. Sometimes he does get his ass beat down and it's like it can, can we reward him? To, to go to the line like James, like we'll be playing the Nets and like like James is getting way more calls. So I mean I understand it's great, but at the same time, it does frustrate when you like a player. I I really like Luka Doncic and how he plays, but at the same time I don't like the complaining. I mean I'm a LeBron James lifer. I the complaining does irritate me as a fan a little bit. Uh, you want to be on their side, but sometimes it's like dude, just get back on D, please. Yeah. And so we've spent a lot of time here on Brad. Um, as we should, um, he is the, he is the number one alpha in the room and we'll see, uh, it, it seems like he's bringing positivity to the locker room. It seems like he's happy. He's still happy to be here. It's not like, you know, Brad Beal has a year, a, 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 less than two years left on his contract. And, you know, we, he, he's on the way out. He's, he's invested at the beginning, but it's hard when you lose. And we, we hit a, a tough spot last year where we, we, we pivoted through. And speaking of last year, after the all-star break, we went 20 and 18, found ourselves in the playoffs, uh, the playing game ended up in the playoffs in the first round and in a, in a five game Philly sweep where Embiid was hurt. 
we exposed the Sixers and, and, and Ben Simmons' poor free throw shooting that end up haunting them later on. But we ended up with a 34-38 and 38 record. After starting the season, I, I don't know what the worst number was, but it was it was pretty pretty bad. Uh, points per game, one sixteen six. That's third out of thirty teams. The only thing is, when you give up one eighteen point five, which is last in the league, that 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 doesn't become efficient. You gotta put you gotta you gotta somewhere find um, yourselves in the top fifteen uh, of defense if you really want to contend in this league. Led the league in pace. Offensive rating, defensive rating, 17th and, and 19th, respectively. Not g- great numbers, but the, the point clearly still sticks out is that we had offense. We just couldn't stop anybody in other ends. And the, seeing that last year, how hard have you? How hard is that as a fan when you know you're scoring, but you just can't get a stop, Chase? Yeah, I mean, it is frustrating, um, and it, you know. When you look at all these stats, team stats from last year, I mean, it's nice to have – it's nice to say that we were in first place out of the 30 teams of pace. But what does that really do? Um, I mean, the way Scott Brooks, you know, his philosophy with, you know, with both teams when he coached, you know, the big three in OKC and when he coached the Wizards, they don't run plays. I mean, there, there's no playbook. It's just go. Uh, just grab it and go. Um, I wanted to ask so, you about that. So do you think that is a a scheme thing? Was it uh, Scotty Brooks being lazy in his preparation? Or was it that I, I have Russell Westbrook and I trust in him. I want to see him go. Plus Brad Beal has such a great feel of the game that um, it, it, when it when our backs are against the wall, I can give him the ball and something good will happen. What's your opinion I, I, on that part of it? I th- I think that that's just his coaching philosophy is we're gonna we're just gonna Let go with pace. We're gonna go and we don't need to run plays. I mean, really, the, in the NBA, all the team, all every thirty teams, they run the same play. They they all know what's happening. This is not like high school or college where you would have to scout because you don't know what you know thumb up twenty three side means. Like everyone's running the same play. So I think. In my personal opinion, I think that Brooks is like, "Hey, we're just gonna go because when when we just if we run and we're gonna be first in pace in the league, no one's gonna know what we're gonna do. It's just they just fast break drills. And of, of of course, he had the luxury of having Russ in OKC and in Washington, so he was able to kind of use his philosophy with the team. But you know, just because you're first in pace doesn't mean you know you're gonna have success. I mean, yes, the Wizards led the, the league in pace and in the top ten. You had the Wizards, you had the Warriors, you had the Timberwolves, you had the Pacers, you had the Rockets, you had Oklahoma City, Sacramento, and New Orleans. So you had <laughs> all those teams were in playoff teams. So good team. you know all these analytic guys. You know if, if you if you look at the pace, it's like yeah, that's great, I, I guess. But none of these teams are playoff teams. If you look at the bottom half of pace, the Knicks, the Heat, the Clippers, the Suns. The Nuggets, the Mavs were 30 through 25. So who cares? I mean, really, who cares about pace? But, I mean, yeah, we we averaged 116 points a game, which was, you know, third. But then, you know, defensive rating was was awful. We, we gave up the most points in the league. So, obviously, you know, hopefully this year, you know, it's not with, you know, with Coach Unsell, you know, and his Speaking philosophy. Of, who's, I was going to ask you def- about that who's a defensive guy, hopefully the pace, you know, won't be as, you know, it, hopefully it's in the middle pack and our defensive stats, you know, obviously improve. And of course we're welcoming a man who has clear ties to the organization. His father, Wes so might be the greatest bullet wizard player of all time. Uh, his, his son came up through this system and worked his butt off, his tail off at, at different organizations, including the Denver Nuggets, where he ju- he just came from, and uh, he he builds rapport with the players. But he, I mean, he's a he's an NBA lifer. He's lived this entire game to give him the opportunity where he's never been a head coach. In my opinion, I like the hire. Uh, I don't think that there was someone there in the coaching pool 
of t- to be hired as like screaming, I want this person uh, to lead our organization. This is going to be the right hire. Uh, when you're in a, I, I don't, I don't know where we are. We, we're in a middler slash rebuilding phase. It's kind of weird when you have uh, an all NBA performer like Brad Beal, um, but you also have young players. We don't have anybody over the age of thirty. Chase, was it, who's our oldest player? The oldest player is Raul Neto at twenty nine. Oh my. Why does Bradley Beal like uh, Neto so much? It seems like I don't, I don't get the value of him uh, necessarily like Brad does. Uh, maybe he's like I feel like okay. I, he probably sees that he plays the game hard, very very hard. But um, Neto, I'm not sold on, on. I'm not sold on Neto. But I think that it, it was they were t- it was due. They needed a new hire. I think that the voice of Scotty Brooks was was done and. And you got to change things up after a while when it's, when it's just not going your way. And it wasn't um, for Scotty, especially with, you know, Russell getting traded. I think that was the icing on the, on the cake that you don't have, you know, your point guard, whatever there. So we're we're wishing Wes Unsell good luck. Um, we'll move on as we, we talk about kind of the, the pieces that make this team and who's going to be a contributor. Because at this point, you can almost identify – 15 guys if you if you're a fan of the game of basketball on this lineup and to 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 the new fan it's like oh man we're a lot better because garrison matthews nobody really hear, like heard of him uh, even neto like uh, there was a lot of rotational pieces on the wizards last year and then we were just begging for um kind of someone to step over and they were fit they you know they tried to fill their roles to the best of their ability but now we got a bunch of guys that are hungry and really trying to prove themselves as not only as a good players, but NBA starters, some people that had maybe started before in their past, um, got a diminished role um, on on certain teams. And, you, you know, you flip that John Wall contract, which to a lot of people is the worst in the NBA, to Russell Westbrook, and then you, you still get some type of value out of that. So let, let's take a little bit of a look at the payroll um, cause we don't have too many pencil, uh, penciled in players for a long time. Person that's guaranteed the most money, uh, through 2024, 25 is Davis Bertans, which to me is one, one of the worst contracts in basketball, paying a guy 16 million really can only do one thing. And, you know, to me, it's like that might win you two, three games throughout a regular season. Definitely not anything to playoffs. Um, I was against this the entire time. Uh, he can really shoot it, but he's a streaky shooter and he doesn't provide too much on the defensive end or anything else offensively. So uh, out of the payroll, what are things that that stick out here? And like we see that, Brad, you know, Bradley's contract expires at, at 2023, 2022-23. And that is a player option that he has that he could exercise at the end of the year. 37 is a, is a, is a, is a high number, but um, he can get that in the open market. Yeah, I mean, like if you look at this team, it, it it's really based on. I mean, all with all the contracts, it's it, it's Bradley Beal. What what are you going to do with Bradley Beal? Um, Bradley Beal or die, like meeting Tank all the way, right? Right. I mean, that's the thing. You, you it's hard to even say. I mean, if you look at these contracts, I mean, obviously the Davis Bertans one is gonna go down as probably a, a mistake unless he averages like 20. I mean, it's crazy because you you just shed Jan Mahimi, which was our, was an eyesore with a four years, 64, whatever he got. Uh, you just had that on the books. You knew every year it's like, oh, my God, we paid this guy so much. And then, boom, we get an opportunity. And we made Davis our number one priority. And, like, I don't know how much the market. They say on the open market he could have got this. But, like, who's paying this guy 16 mil? He had one year. Some- I, I, I agree. I think I think if we didn't offer that contract, he wouldn't. He would have got a similar one from another team, just the way the league is. But you know, you're always gonna have that talk of is he gonna be, you know, the that guy who in the category of there are a lot of guys who you know get paid and they just don't <laughs> they don't live up to their money. I mean, yeah. Uh, the you know the 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 first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, we're getting off the Wizards topic for a, just a second, but the first guy who 
got paid when all this started happening, maybe, I don't know, four off seasons ago, was Alan Crabb. And I was like in shock that I don't know the specific numbers on top of my head, but he got paid so much money and uh, it, like obviously never panned out. I don't even know if he even like played after his contract. Like he was just was hurt left, right, and center. And obviously, I think he's out of the league. I mean, I that was the year that they really increased while. the salary cap. That and was the only first got paid. year. That right. was Mo- Mozgov got paid. Like there was. Uh, right a handful of people that have generational wealth because the NBA right. increased their salary cap. And yeah, I guess they, they wanted to yeah. spend the money or it, they wouldn't be able to have contracts to match up uh, the philosophy behind it. To me, I think that that's what made good general managers as opposed to general managers that kind of suck that dealt with that situation um, cause that was this, that was the summer everyone got paid. Uh, we're not there anymore. And, and we decided to, to give him uh super love. A lot of these contracts are, they end at the end of, you know, either, either this season or next season. And, you know, you can always like open up your books. You're not tied into that. Russell, Russell Westbrook contract. You're not tied into the John wall anymore. Uh, you have Brad Beal and then you had, yeah, you have a uh, Bertans at 16, but that doesn't, cap hold you to the to the point where you can't do anything um i did want to move on to our lineups what we think about them because we talked about 15 people being kind of identifiable on this wizards lineup but who where's the cream of the crop who's going to start out of this group um i got a projected starting lineup that i'm going to throw out here and that is spencer dinwiddie brad beal who i think are two locks and then you have Kyle Kuzma, who's spent time in the starting lineup, as well as the bench for the Lakers. Rui Hachimura, who, um, I mean, we're we're just going to talk about that uh, <laughs> after we talk about our protected starting line. We're going to talk about the really what's going on with him. Uh, we we don't, we haven't seen him at camp. That's kind of a huge question mark. And then Ga- Daniel Gafford, who came on late, it was just kind of a, uh, a steal of uh, a part of a trade with the with with the bulls that we gave him an opportunity. And I mean, the kid that plays ferocious, I mean, he's, he's blocking people. He's, he's dunking on people. Um, he has that vigor and fight that you look for in a big fella. And with uh, Thomas Bryant having the ACL injury, he's still recovering. It opens up a starting spot as well as, you know, Montrezl Harrell, who is a new acquisition, He's known to come off the bench and be a spark plug. He almost won a six-man of the year, averaging 19 a game for the Clippers just two years ago. So uh, what do you think about this starting lineup that I have projected? Do you have any gripes? And uh, can you do you have any insight on the Rui situation? Because we want him. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would agree that this is probably – the starting lineup. I mean, again, for now, Kuzma, <laughs> for now, for I mean, it's going to change a lot because we are, quote unquote, deep. As in, there are many different options you can throw in. I mean, if you want to go smaller, you could throw in KCP. If you want to see what Denny well, just can to do. get just to give the folks at home a visual or uh, a voice behind it, uh, my projected bench is Aaron Holiday. Um, KCP, Contavious Coldwell, Pope that came in the Laker trade for Russell. Denny Osvio was picked nine overall last year. Davis Bertans, we got 60 plus mil on his head. Montrezl Harrell, one of the greatest um, six men that we have as far as definitely from um, the post player position. And if I look, I take a deep look at the deep bench. <laughs> Cassius Winston was a hell of a player in college. All Neto was a maybe a top seven <laughs> rotation, rotational player last year. Corey Kispert uh, comes off of player of the year in his conference, leading his Gonzaga team to a regular season of undefeated. It's just a straight lockdown shooter. Our lottery pick this year, Isaiah Todd, uh, a, a two-way guy that, you know, he won't play much this year. And then Thomas Bride that you're waiting on because he looked like he had some problems before he tore his ACL last year, especially his ability to shoot the three ball, which we previously had never saw. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at all the projected starting lineup, you know, the bench and then the guys 10 through 15, like I said, these are all names. You know, the average Wizards fans know these names. 
Now, I'm going to go back to what I said. Are they deep? We don't know yet. Do they mm-hmm. have names? Yes. Um, in terms of the starting lineup, uh, if this is the starting lineup, um, it, it's solid. I mean, you have everything you want. You have Gafford who's going to protect the rim. You have him as a pick and roll lob threat. You have Beal who, as we talked about earlier, can do everything. Um, but I, what I'm worried about is are we going to be able to stretch the floor with mm. this starting lineup? Mm. I mean, Kuzma, do you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't really trust him right now to be that three and D player. Um, Rui, who I love, except you know, we'll see how he transitions into shooting the ball from a deeper range, but. Right as of now, Rui is out. He, you know, he hasn't been at. He wasn't at training camp at all. He wasn't at any of the preseason games so far. Um, he is out due to personal reasons. And uh, yeah, the Wizards, the Wizards, you know, PR staff is doing a good job. Just kind of, you know, they they announced it the day, you know, before training camp. They just said he's going to be out due to personal reasons. They said out indefinitely, and they kind of it's kind of been just kicked under the carpet, and no one's been asking or trying to figure out because i uh, personally i just don't think anyone really knows so we don't know when Rui is going to come back we don't know what he's doing or what personal reasons means that can that can mean a plethora of of things so we you can't speculate know. anymore after Not the Kyrie thing last year is like mental right. health is important and we do not know the reasons why Rui is not showing up um, right. There were so, people drafted in this position. There were people traded that play his same position re- uh, most recently. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if that, that I'm not trying to speculate or anything because we don't know. It's just it's it, it, it makes a question mark because a player at his stature in his third year, third year, you see the big jump. You see guys go up in their points per game and Rui stayed similar to his his uh, rookie year and he's still learning the game and and he has a, the physical tools to be an elite defender and and and, and a positive um, offensive player that you know you know the, the wizards would really be remiss if they didn't see this out and so i think that they've been locked into Rui and kind of been like you know we want you to be kind of our next star but this situation with him not being in camp that obviously takes takes a step back and um, makes you que- again question what are we going to do with this lineup and who who's filling in and and what's the status on Rui going forward? Right, um, and you know Rui to me is the most important player hmm. for this franchise. Hmm. Moving forward, it's not Brad, it's not Dinwiddie, it's not Denny, it is Rui. Rui has all the tools to be the guy if and when Brad departs. So, you know, I think all Wizards fans just want to make sure he's good and whatever is going Going on in his life that, you know, hopefully we can have him back soon because he is going to be the most important person, not only this year, but moving forward for years to come. Now, um, my, our new additions, and we've taken a look at the, at the cast of characters, a lot of them um, coming from the Lakers, either her- heralded or not not heralded in the playoffs, as we got Montrez Harrell coming in, Kyle Kuzma, Contavious Cobo Pope, um, Spencer Dinwiddie, and, of course, we have somebody we may not have mentioned yet, um, and that's the third Holiday brother and Aaron Holiday. Now, I like – things about all of these players um and actually they, they look like that's like a mob that you could go to the park with and and do well i do have some questions though you talked about the ability to stretch the floor and spencer not like including last year cuz he only played 10 games but the year prior um this is this is pre kyrie pre uh kd who missed that entire year anyways uh, he averaged 20.6 points a game, uh, 4.3 rebounds, 6.8 assists. But when you look at his three-point percentage, it was 30.8. He Yeah, he made 1.9, but that's a lot of threes going up and not too many going in. 
Um, I, I also I take a, a similar look at Kyle Kuzma. He, he averaged 36 from three point land, which is sort of the Mendoza line. You kind of want it to be a, a little bit higher, and he averaged two three pointers a game. Again, uh, field goal percentage 44. Spencer at 41.5, like total field goal percentage. These aren't too efficient, uh, efficient stats. And Aaron Holiday coming in shot 39 last year. Um, and I look, I like me some Aaron Holiday. I think he's an efficient player. I think he's going to be a solid backup point guard. And I, I, hopefully he can he can step it, it himself up and get some more minutes. As he only averaged 18 minutes a game last year for the Pacers. As they got a little bit loaded in the backcourt. Contavious Colwell Paul, he's a lock. And he plays on the, uh, on the other end. Um, but he's not a difference maker. I think he's a tradable piece going forward. He should he should actually be on a contending team as opposed to uh, being with us, especially when we have Corey Kispert as a rookie in the flat. Uh, I think that he's a, he's a tradable piece. But with these new additions, um, Trez gives you rebounds and, 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 and energy. Spencer gets a new look to start at point guard, like officially, and and really have that under under his wing. But hey, he's coming off an ACL injury. Um, Kuzma's trying to prove himself. He had his highest career points per game happened in his rookie year, averaging 16. And uh, it's kind of been tough with the whole LeBron uh, situation. Of the new additions, who are you most excited with, and who do you see having a long future here um, in Washington? And who th- who do you think fits right in? Who changes the culture a little bit? I mean, that's a lot of good guys, a lot of names that people may recognize. Who do you who do you have your your eyes on, or or somebody that you're really looking at, like they could hopefully make a difference here, or make something out of their career that's more than it is. Uh, you know, that's that's, that's a great question. Just because when you see these new additions, first of all, there's just so many of them. I mean, five five new additions. That, that's who who are all quote unquote names. Well, not to mention the lottery pick and, and Corey Kispert, who was the player of the year of his conference. And not right. to mention Isaiah Todd is an intriguing prospect going forward from the G League. Right. So, you know, the, what I'm what I'm worried about with this team is is the the lineups that Coach Unsell is going to have to just navigate try, through. Yeah. navigate mm-hmm. through. And, and there's just so many pieces. It's like you have to play – KCP because of what he can do on the defensive end, and that's what you want to improve as the team. He can stretch the and floor to keep and his a, trade his trade value too. You, you got to play him. right, and he's a great three point shooter. But how is Coach Unsell going to play all these guys in a forty eight minute game? It, it it's, you know Holiday. I mean, the thing we haven't even in this picture. You know, we we don't have Neto. We don't have. Uh, Denny, we don't have Kispert. Where are you going to find minutes for all of these guys? I mean, it, it, I I think as much as I love Coach Ansel and I thought it was a fantastic hire, I think this year is going to be very tough with just playing with the lineups. I mean, Coach Brooks, he was criticized sometimes because he would throw out these lineups and he didn't keep you know, the same rotation and he wasn't consistent. And I think it's going to be the same with coach Unsell where he's going to have to try these things. And again, you're going to have to, I think the average wizards fans, because they know Kuzma, it's like, he is going to be our third guy, but is he, I mean, again, I can see a lot of players on this team, not getting the minutes that they think they deserve and not getting the minutes that they want because and again I'm going to say this again quote unquote we are deep but I don't know how deep we are again Aaron Holiday is a name uh, more because of his brothers but he didn't get a lot of run in Indiana he never had his opportunity so does he just get into the same role as he was with the Wizards where let's just play him around 16 to 18 minutes or is he going to be a 24 to 28 minute backup playing well we don't know yet so this this team is just so interesting because there's so many different players you can play and different lineups but again you're gonna have guys getting 
DNP CDs because there's no there's, there's no time <laughs> there's no time for them all. Again, Neto was one of our best 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 bench players last year. So are I you just not gonna, are you just not going to play him because you have these new guys coming in? It, it, the guys are going to be fighting for minutes right now. It's interesting too. It's like, did, did he find a, a certain trust with Scotty Brooks, who, you know, was a point guard himself in our NBA, and maybe it took a liking to the fact that that kid is scrappy. I'll give it to him. Um, but we threw <laughs> we threw out a hell of a lot of three guard lineups last year, and it helps that Russell Westbrook is the greatest rebounding point guard of all time. But now we just we loaded up on a position that like it it felt like we we needed some help in, which was that that small four power four position. Players that have been high, drafted highly or have proven themselves in the NBA that they should be playing. That's a that's a tough thing to manage as a coach, especially a first year coach. And um, Wes Unseld has the persona from when I see him when, when I see him talk that he has control, uh, that he is an honest person and he's about empowering his players and making them better, not only players, but humans. So I, I feel like that could, could go a long way with certain people, but not everyone. Someone's going to get left out. Someone's going to be salty. Uh, someone's going to be hurt. Um, maybe he <laughs> makes – he makes the front office mad, and he's like, "Look, uh, Tommy Shepard, shouldn't have gave this guy sixty mil. He sucks. Like, I got a, I got, I, I got a rookie that's better than him, right? I got Corey Kispert that can do more. Um, even though that graphing is off, he can do more, and he's he's ready to play right now. What do, what do you want me to tell me? Like, and who knows if he's getting told, hey." Just just play play this lineup, play play this guy a little bit more, and does he have to follow it as a first year coach? Like those things, nobody really sees, and those are questions that I want to see answered throughout the season. Now, Vegas, of course, Vegas somehow knows everything, but they got an over under on thirty three point five. Do we hit? Do we not hit? We won thirty four last year with Russell Westbrook. We barely got in the play in. Does 33.5 and we won 34 last year? Does that make sense? I mean, of course, it was a 72 game season. This is 82. I should say that up front. Like, it's like, oh, it's the same thing. No, it, it's not. Okay, this is back to normal uh, as far as 82 game schedule. Do we hit 34 wins? That's a great number. I mean, like you said, Vegas is. <laughs> Why? How do they know it? Is. What are they doing it, over there? It, it, they're 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 honestly gonna either hit thirty five or thirty three. It, it's not gonna it, like it's gonna be super super close. It's not like they're gonna go. They're not gonna go anything above. You heard it first. <laughs> forty, and they're not gonna go below. You know, twenty five. They're gonna be around that thirty three to thirty six area. I think. Um, I man, it, it's tough. I, I I'll say over. Um, again, because it is the East, um, I know you can say that every year and I know people always say the East is getting better, but like, it is, they got three of the top four teams in the NBA. I, I agree, Arguably. but it's, it, it's, it's the last teams. It's, it's like, <laughs> you're going to play the Pistons four times. You're going to play the magic four times. You're going to play the Cavs four times. You're going to play Toronto four times. And I know that's rare to say because Toronto so Toronto has been so good, but they're yeah. I think going to be awful this year. Um, and I mean, right there, that that could be. You should be, be taking three out of four, out of with with those five teams right there. So there's fifteen wins. There's half your wins um, against okay. the bottom half of the East. Um, it is Vegas. You're obviously, doing your math. I see. Obviously, that's not going to happen because last year we lost to the Pistons, I think, three out of the four games. We lost to the Magic three out of the four games. Uh, I know we lost to the Cavs, I think, half. So, you know, can't, that's what, that was the problem last year. We, you know, whatever our record was, 16 and 30 at the time, it's because we were losing to the bad teams. But we beat last year, we beat Utah at home. We beat 
Boston at home. We beat Denver at home. We had some great wins last year, and it was we beat like Brooklyn how, twice. We beat Brooklyn twice. So how do we? How are we beating these? Awesome like when they had a losing? full, they had a full lineup. Yeah, and, and we, that was a home them. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Russ got the steal. Oh my god! Um, and hit the three. He had a, so he had a three. Yeah, I, I would. Mean, I'll, Brad, I'll Brad say did too. Yeah, that was a. Great I'll say game. over. I'll say they will get over. Yeah, 34. Uh, 30, 33 it, and a half. Let's call it easy. You know, Kyle, <laughs> Kyle Kuzma taking us to the to the edge. Yeah, I it, it, I feel like that is a, a strong number. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you do with that? But that doesn't get you in a play-in game. So does that mean, like, and how does that affect you when you get to that point? Like, you don't have Russell being like, hell no, nah, coach. We are going to try to win all of these games. And Brad – Brad ain't like fond of losing. He's not. He's not down with the tank game. And what I'm getting from Wes on so he's like he's gonna try to play every game to it's his last. Like um, our our bench guys too. It's not like Oklahoma City. You can just throw out got in lack of a better term. Nobody in the NBA is somebody from the street. But like throw out people kind of from the street as far as people we don't we haven't ever heard of. If you're gonna throw out somebody in this 15 man lineup, you're gonna have somebody that is good at basketball. And are they gonna just like try to just get theirs and get their number and maybe try to find a different destination? I, I, that depends on the locker room. A lot of the locker room is heavy on that. And, and will they go against the coach? Uh, does he find in a lineup? This this guy just like really. <laughs> Uh, very understanding of basketball. He's the next new age, really good young coach, um, which happened to be a, you know, a local like protege in, in a sense that his, his father put his blood, sweat and tears into this organization. And now he can come into the forefront. That would be ideal for us as Wizards fans. Uh, we really don't know. There's a lot of the don't knows coming into the, a preseason preview, but we talked about the characters that we'll look at. We talked about the new additions um the the rookies uh i actually did want to ask you about uh kispert on our way out because it, we we talked off air before we got on it's going to be hard for him to get minutes but for a lottery pick like himself that is actually ready to play right now i mean th- th- he's basically a 50 40 90 player in college last year at 19 points a game and, and can can rebound uh how do you not play him? You know what I mean? But then you think about it. Uh, Danny Avia got in drafted nine overall. Uh, Bertans is on, you know, a, a very high contract. You got Kuzma that's trying to prove himself. And really, who you really kind of want to give the franchise keys, at least as a second guy uh, with a with a, with the, with the roster construction that we have now. That's a lot of like a lot of guys in this position. Um but at the same time, like, I don't know. I feel like he's good enough to play. Maybe I'm too high on Corey Kispert. You tell me. Uh, I just honestly, with this team and what number you picked him at, I have him uh, getting a lot of do not did not play coaches decisions. Okay. Um, and again, there's there there's no pressure to play him because you drafted him at 15. It's not like you drafted him at nine you know it wasn't he wasn't a lottery pick so he might be better no, than the guy that you drafted at he nine. he could he could be but for now again there, there's no there's no time for Corey Kispert right now because you have to see you know if you're if you're looking at the roster you have to see what Denny can do first you have to see if Denny's gonna be part of the future or not um because you picked him at nine um, over some some guys who were you know questionable last year, so you have to play Denny because you're not you would you know as Wizards fans, you'd rather see Corey Kispert have a DNP than Denny. Um, and it, I just don't see Kispert as being the uh, a big part of the future. I think at the time during the draft, he was the best available on their board, and they said, "All right, you know, we'll we'll go with him," but. You know, it, it's not. There's no pressure to play Kispert. He, you know, again, if, if he doesn't become the next Joe Harris, it, what what is he? And Joe Harris, well, jo- hey Joe, it took a while, and just it like took Corey a Kispert, long time. Well, no just one like even, 
Corey did this even... too in college. Corey was not in as a freshman in college. He was not tough. Like he was, he had a growth spurt that helped him out in college, but he was not playing much as a fresh. He's gotten better each and every year. And then the senior year, he averaged 19 on a team that, that had Jalen, Jalen subs. Like they, well, they were loaded all around. They had Joel Ayaji. Like they were legit undefeated team. Um, and I, like that is actually kind of my my comp to to pro and of course you know white boy shooter uh that can do a little bit more of course it's it's, it's comparable um but that's where I see Kisper I see it's a solid role and it, let me ask you this question because I'm sure you have a, a thought that you were you were probably going to mention but like let me ask you this question if Corey Kispert is on our team from last year which doesn't have all these other players kind of play in his position. Uh, whether it's the Laker guys or maybe it's our ret- returning players, does he does he play? Does he make a does he get meaningful minutes in the playoffs? Because I think so. I think that we needed somebody else to produce, you know, something out of out, out outside of Russ and Brad, which defense is completely locked in on that. Uh, it, it's hard to say. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty because you know he yeah. wasn't drafted <laughs> last year. Um, so we, I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, but like, uh, going back to the Joe Harris thing, Joe, they I feel like they're very similar. I mean, yes, Joe Harris is not just a three point shooter, even though that's his specialty, he can do more. And I, I think same with Kispert, but yeah, both played four years in college and, but people don't know Joe Harris started out in Cleveland yeah, and his rookie year. He played 51 games, so he had all those DMPs. And then the second year, he played five games, and he averaged three minutes a game because he was in the G League most of the year. And this was before the two-way contract, so he was in the G League the whole entire year. And then it wasn't until his first year of Brooklyn where he got some minutes and they saw that he could play. So it took him two years plus two years with a one-year G League uh, year that to show that he can play in this league. So with with Kispert, I think it's going to be a very similar path. You know, I don't, I wouldn't okay. be surprised if you know he play he gets in the G League for a little bit because I I mean if I'm running the Wizards, I, I would want him to get experience in the G League again. What there's no point of drafting someone and not playing them. But again, the, where, where are you going to find minutes for this kid? I mean. Well, you need to see Denny, who got picked nine overall just the year prior, um, Avia. And then you also have to give uh, Rui a strong look whenever he decides to come in. And you give him all the tools to like either take the job over or get passed over. And when you got a lot of people in your position, cream of the crop right. steps I up. I mean, really, be, you know, between let, – let's talk about – Let's go back to not positionless basketball. Let's talk about our small forwards. Uh, KCP, Denny, Kispert, um, Kuzma. So there's, you know, four small forwards right there. And Davis uh, uh, has a uh, skill set uh, as a small forward, but right. you can't throw him out there because he can't defend anybody. So traditional – Either position. Right. So traditional small forwards, I think we have four of them. I mean, KCP could be a shooting guard, but – I'm putting him a small forward right now. Yeah. Right. You're not playing Kispert over KCP. You're not playing him over Kuzma. And you're not playing him over Denny. So there, there's just no time for him. I mean, again, I think he's going to play. I think the only way he plays if with injuries. If Denny goes down, KCP goes down, or Kuzma. But th- there's just – I don't think – I feel like there's no rush to play him this year because – you have they they have to make a, a trade a trade at the deadline. You, you can't have this team the whole entire year. You just can't. You're going to have to make a a, a package deal because it, it, it's just there's too many guys. Again, if you look at you know championship playoff teams, they don't they're not as deep as yeah. these. My wizards. brother used to always tell me he's like too much of a good thing is actually a bad thing, and I <laughs> think that's where we are at. And we, because they're they're good, they're not, and then there's no greatness outside of that. Like you got you got Brad, but 
uh, too much of a good thing is actually a bad thing because there's you know, there's only so many miles of feet. And we know on a basketball court, you've been there, I've been there, there's only five guys that can play. And the best five guys should play the most minutes. And, yeah, you can strategize that in 48 minutes how you want to, but getting 15 minutes a game compared to 25, 30 minutes a game is huge, uh, not only for your team but for your career as whole. And then we got guys that are, should be priming, uh, guys that are coming up. They're all, they're kind of in, in, in different boats, but um, – as competitive basketball players, you want to go and get it. And somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. Whether that's Gafford, Montrezl Harrell, and Bryant, whether that's our collective group of the small forward wing position that we talked about, um, and then whether that's our point guard position that Spencer Dinwiddie, who's not completely proven as a point guard and is coming off a of torn ACL, Plus Drew uh, Aaron Holiday that, you know, I, I wouldn't say he's a complete lock at your backup point. So, like, what do you do? Do you package that around? Do you find another team that, you know, is heavy in those other positions? Those are all things that you're going to have to answer around that trade deadline. And I think that you and I both can agree that um, this a lineup that we have today isn't going to be the entire lineup going to the end of the year. And, uh, Tommy Shepard, our general manager, has, has proven that he's not af afraid to make a move. Uh, he, I, it feels like he's a little calculated in those de these decisions, and he's pretty upfront and honest. I kind of like that from him because um, I couldn't really get a great feel from Randy Grunfield and the tenure before him. But excited as a Wizards fan a little bit more than last season outside of the Russ factor, which I was just elated about. I just really wanted to see Russell Westbrook. And that made things exciting. I I hope the, these other pieces can bring that same excitement. It's different. It's a different lineup, and let's see if we hit that thirty three point five. So so with that said, I think it's been a great conversation. I think that any wizard enthusiast would would dive into this. Uh, I think that we not only covered their previous uh, stints, our new arrivals, our our draft picks, our current payroll situation. A new coach. Um, but at the end of the day, the question mark still loom and we'll be tuned in. Uh, Chase, any last words, anything you need to plug, um, anything you want to say to the people as we kind of wrap things up here? Triple play fantasy uh, Wizards basketball preview show, which is our first NBA basketball team. Hopefully not our last. Uh, no, I'm just going to say it, it, it's, it was exciting to work. The, the Wizards game the other night with, you know, full all the fans were there and, you know, everybody was, you know, all the floor seats are back. So it, it was great to be back to normal. Um, and I think it's going to be great for the league. And it's the 75th year. And uh, the NBA Lane commercial, I've watched about probably 75 times because it was it's the greatest commercial I've seen. So uh, it's going to be a great season, I feel like. And uh, I'm excited because, again, there's, you know, there's some really good teams and we, you know, there's not one team that's, uh, you know, a, a lot of teams could win the finals this year. And I think uh, that's great for the league because, you know, people were always hating on the league about it was, you know, it's going to be the Warriors and and it could be the Warriors this year. We don't know. I, and I think there's a lot of question marks and we'll, we'll see how the league goes. But ball season's up upon us and it, it's exciting. And that it that is exciting to have that feel and. When the Wizards fans show up, the building can actually be electric. And I've been there when we win. And as a, as a DC fan and, and and love my teams, we really don't come out until we're legitimate and we prove ourselves that we're we're good and we're a reason to come out. Uh, the Washington football team is struggling with attendance. They're the lowest they've ever been, going from like the top to the low. Um, the Wizards have have up and downs. I've been at games where it feels like I'm at an away <laughs> stadium. I felt uh, electric times when they're damn good and they're playing against, you know, really good teams. So let's hopefully that the Wizards put out a good product, that we have a good year. I'll be tuned. Chase will be tuned. We'll catch back up on another time. I appreciate you, my brother. 
it was good talking to you. Uh, your insight is uh, second to none when it comes to the Wizards, but not only that, but basketball in general. And, you know, I just I, I just appreciate good good conversations with good people that, that know the game of basketball. I hate arguing with the 12-year-old that tells me that I'm a LeBron James bandwagon fan. When I when I have LeBrons on my feet that are older than that kid, so I'm gonna end on my that little spiel, um, and uh, we hope that you tune in to our 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 next pod.